By the way, I'm going to preach from here rather than on the other thing. Actually, I'm not going to preach today. Today, I am an enhanced liturgist. Uh, my job is to help out with the, the drama cast. Um, so the, our, our cast is going to, of actors is going to, they're not exactly going to portray the Bible story as it is written, because the story we have today I, I just, I don't know if you're allowed to say this, but it's written poorly. Uh, it's just, it just doesn't really, when you just read it, you're going to, it just doesn't work. So um, Luke could have used an editor on this one, but I wasn't around, so there. Um, but I'm going to share you share with you some of the key verses and then some summary around that and maybe a little things that feel a little preachy there. But in between these little short descriptions of Paul, the castaway, our drama troupe is going to give their sense of what does it feel like today when you are just cast away by the struggles of life. So when uh, Jalyn and Kayla and I, we started this, we, st we started reading this story back there together, and we just, it was really slow. I think this is, especially with these hard scriptures that don't flow, they're not, these aren't children's stories, they don't flow like you can teach them at a, around a campfire. So when they're hard, it's good to do it together. And you start to peel layers, and you start to name kind of what's going on in the story. A and they started to sort of peel those away and come up with questions like, so how do you, what do you do when you have no control over your circumstances? How, how do you trust in life when just nothing is working? Uh, or they ask, how do you respond when the world seems to just gloss over your pain and minimize your pain? Do you, do you just like persevere with a smile or do you, do you just trust and hold on to your faith or do you throw your hands up and give up or do you rage against it? What do you, all of it maybe. They ask, is it possible, is it even helpful to hold on to any sense of hope when God seems just so distant and so unresponsive? Uh, what, is, I mean, that, what is hope even made of when we are threatened the most? And through all of that, through, at the end of the story, at the end of your stories, when you've seen your experiences of being shipwrecked from our own loves and our own dreams, when we survey it all from, a, from dry land, how in the world did we get through that? I mean, it wasn't just my strength, but what's, where did that strength come from and help us to persevere? So responding to those questions will be their job. Uh, let's, let's see, who's the cast? Uh, that's our cast today. Um, so they're up here taking bows, yep. And my job as the enhanced liturgist is to start with the book of Acts, the first two chapters. So uh, give me that one, Tom. Um, when the time came, we set sail for Italy. Paul and several other prisoners were placed in the custody of a Roman officer named Julius. Let me just flesh that out. He's on a prison ship. He's on a ship with a bunch of prisoners. Now, this is a special, if this was just regular prison, they'd just be stuck in a hole, right? They'd be stuck in prison. It would be terrible. These are the prisoners all over Israel who are granted the right to defend themselves in Rome. So these are all Roman citizens. That means they're like white collar criminals mostly. Um, and they're going to go all the way from Israel to Rome. They started on, in, in Caesarea, a little town in, in Israel, and they, they're heading, this is a boat that's going to head to West Turkey and then all the way to Rome. So they're going to sail all the way along the southern Turkish coast, past Greece and all the way there. Now, the southern Turkish coast, let me tell you, that is a beautiful, beautiful place. I just drove the whole dang thing last week. It's a long way. There's big mountains, beautiful beaches, lots of ins and outs, and it's called, they call it the turquoise coast. It's You should go. Um, but it is a lot safer from land than from sea. Let's see the next one, Tom. Um, we encountered strong winds that made it difficult to keep the ship on course. But we sailed on, and it describes just like a lot of their sailing issues, and we landed at Myra in the province of Lycia. Okay, time out. The drama cast is going to get to do their thing here, but this is a point of personal privilege because it's just too cool. Last Sunday... When you were in church, guess where I was? In Myra. In Myra. Total accident. Um, now, I had planned to be in Myra ages ago because the Bishop of Myra is St. Nicholas, and St. Nicholas is St. Jolly St. Nick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shh. 
this is online too, some kids could be. So um, I had planned to go there because St. Nick was the Bishop of Myra like 300 years before this story. And I did, I went there and I'm gonna tell you more about it in December when we get to his feast day. But just to think about, the worship team months ago said, let's do a drama on this Sunday. And then I had a bunch of different possible scriptures. There were three possible scriptures. And the worship team said, a couple, several weeks ago, they said, like a month ago, they said, let's pick this one. And then, you know, I didn't really have any clue that I was going to be, like, my, it's not an important detail of the story. That verse doesn't really, nothing matters about that verse. But last Sunday, I'm having lunch. Y'all are all asleep at this time. And uh, Stacy asked, like, what are we doing in church this Sunday? And I said, Acts 27. Now, you might assume, you might know, Stacy and I are kind of Bible nerds. So when I said Acts 27, she pulled out her phone, went to the app, and she just started reading because we were waiting for our Turkish pizza, and it was taking a long time. And she started reading, and she, she said, Myra, we're in Myra. We're there. It's here, right here. So um, this light came on to me. Now, I knew that Paul grew up in southeastern Turkey, and so much of his ministry was all over that country, what is now that country. But the timing of seeing it in the Bible, that it's literally the ground you're walking on all around you, even this obscure verse, it just kind of, it just hit me. And so I thought, could we find the place where Paul landed? Could we go to that spot? And the answer is yes. We know precisely where the port of Myra was. It's this little suburb. It's about two or three kilometers from the center of town. It's called Andriaki. Let's see it. It's right there. Now, the, now most of the ancient shorelines in the world have silted up. Ephesus is like five miles from the ocean now, but it used to be you could sail right there. This is very silted up, even though you can still see some sailboats in there. But this big uh, castle looking thing, that's the edge of where the dock would have been 2000 years ago. And Paul would have gotten off the boat right there in this story. There's a museum and all that stuff. Right there, Prisoner Paul. Prisoner Paul had sailed from uh, Israel to this spot, and he must have already been tired, kind of, kind of exhausted, already uncomfortable. He's probably, like, what do we know about Paul in the world? He's a little arrogant. Like, if you've read any Bible, he seems a little arrogant. Okay, so what happens when people are arrogant and they take a big fall? It's hard to struggle with humility for, like, the first time in your life. So he's dealing with some of that. He's struggling with his limits of, of, of freedom and what does my life, you know, what does my life mean right now? He's probably struggling with boredom because he used to read all the time. Now he's stuck. He's on this boat and he's like, will I ever get out? I might go all the way to Rome and be stuck in a prison there forever. He's struggling with, you, you have to assume, demeaning treatment from some of the guards and danger from some of the other prisoners. And this helplessness is starting to ache. Would he ever be whole again? And can any of us, when we're stuck in our circumstances, when we are trapped in these systems, when we are more number than name, when we're barely survivor and never alive, how do we go about finding relief? How do we go about finding purpose in that? And for Paul, this is the moment where his story really begins. From Myra, they begin to encounter, they start to sail away. They begin to encounter such bad weather that they have to decide, do we fight through this and we risk uh, being in a shipwreck? Or it's wintertime, they're in this crappy little port. Do they just stay here for three more months stuck on a ship with no freedom, three more months until they can fight for their possible, possible freedom? So Paul is damaged for sure, but more so he's damned if he sails and he's damned if he don't. There's no good option. There's no holy option. There's nothing that God can say to give them an answer. But a choice has to be made because in life, choices have to be made. Act one. Oh my goodness. Girl, you're literally a lifesaver. Whatever you need, what's up? I had that um, incident, you know, and... Um, well, I, I hardly think a seizure is just an incident. Okay, uh, fair, but anyway, I was playing phone tag with the radiology clinic all day yesterday. 
And they finally called and said that the doctor wants me in today if I can. Oh, that's wonderful. So much sooner than we thought. Yeah, except Junior has a fever. Oh, so no. I can't take him with the way things are right now at hospitals, and I definitely can't take him to somewhere to get an MRI. So the next opening is next month if I can't get in today. Okay, well, I got it. Don't you worry. I'll keep him company, and I'll keep my distance at the same time. Go get your scan. Okay, thanks so much. Um, I'll be back soon, okay? Feel better. How are you feeling, Junior? I have a fever. I'm sorry, bud. Can I get you anything? I'm okay. Is mom okay? I think she will be. The doctors know what they're doing, and it just takes time. We have to be patient. Um, you're sick too, though, so let's just focus on getting you better right now. I get colds all the time. Mom had a seizure. That's way scarier. It is scary, and I'm so sorry that that happened. I wish I could go to the hospital with her. I know. It would have been nice to be with her, but sometimes we have to do hard things, right? I don't like hard things. <sighs> Me neither, buddy. Me neither. Oh, you can save it. There's more acts. There's muddy, plenty more, plenty more, plenty more. Uh, <coughs> I don't like hard things. Ain't nobody does. Okay, uh, Tom. When a light wind began blowing from the south, the sailors, they thought they could make it. So they pulled up anchor and sailed close to the shore of Crete. But the weather changed abruptly, and a wind of typhoon strength burst through the, uh, across the island and blew us out to sea. The next day, uh, as gale force winds continued to batter the ship, the crew began throwing cargo overboard. The terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the sun and stars until at, la at last all hope was gone. Okay, when you're throwing stuff overboard on a ship, you are in survival mode. You are in absolute, that's, that's all you got left is to survive, and you're making desperate decisions. What do I throw out? Do I throw this thing that I, I can't live without or this thing I can't live without? And friends, we have all been in the place where we are so focused on survival that we just make desperate decisions. Things like, just one more credit card and I'm going to get through this. If I just get one more credit card, it'll hold me through one more week and I'll be able to get through. Just one more drink, and then I'll be ready to stop. One more, just tonight, and then it'll all be better. If I can do, just, just let me do this one thing at work, because it's really important. If I do this one thing at work, and then I'll be able to play with the kids. I feel so alone, and people keep talking to me about stuff. But I, honestly, until I get my stuff together, I'm a mess. So until I get my stuff together, no one's going to want to be around me. So I'm just going to stay alone a little longer until I'm ready. Let's see another one, Tom. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me, and the angel said, Do not be afraid, Paul, for you will surely be able to stand trial before Caesar. Okay, if I'm Paul, I say, Thanks a lot, angel. <laughs> this is great. Yeah. First off, do not be afraid. Angels say it all the time. Sometimes it's really meaningful. Sometimes you want to say back to the angel, uh, you're not in this situation. You don't know what this is like. Angels can't even drown. I'm stuck on a boat. I, angels can't go to prison. They can walk through the door. Angel, you don't know how I feel. No one knows how I feel. And second of all, don't worry. You get to go to court. That's, uh, that's pretty rough. Don't ever tell your friends that. Uh, you're going to live, but it's going to suck, and it's going to suck worse later. You're going you're to make it, but it's oof, rough. How often do our own, our own angels, the angels, the people who are really angels in our lives, still their words of comfort and reassurance can feel so hollow or even so aggressive? How often are our, our spirits are just so low that anything else that anyone says brings us down even further? And when it actually is kind of thoughtless and kind of callous, how often does that just really hurt our relationship and hurt our entire kind of direction of healing? Paul, is, he was damaged. He was already damaged. And he will be delivered, but he is far from okay in this situation. Act 2.
I got my labs drawn last week. They take a long time, don't they? I wish I had the answers already, though. I put a prayer request in the prayer chain. Pretty soon, a whole line of folks lined up with their two cents. I went through the same thing, well, almost the same thing anyways, to fix it. It always gets worse before it gets better. At least it's not COVID, right? Every cloud has a silver lining. So I guess everyone goes through things like this, but they all seem to handle it fine. Maybe it's not a big deal. Am I making too big of a deal out of this? Oh, I heard about your test, but have you been following the news in Palestine? Can you imagine if you were there going through this? When hard things happen to me, I like to remember that it all works out in the end. Have you tried essential oils? <laughs> Lots of people have their solutions and their own stories and other people's stories, and that's nice, I guess. But I didn't really want solutions, you know? I just didn't want to feel alone. Have you tried praying about it? God can work miracles. I saw a list of 99 verses about trusting God on Facebook. I'll send you the link. I wonder how God will use this. He works all things. That hurt the most. God knows about what's happening. And He's not fixing it, though. They're just letting it happen, and, and he wants to use this? Somehow, when everyone's done saying their piece, I feel more alone than before. About midnight on the 14th night of the storm, and just picture that. You're stuck on a boat for 14 days just trying to survive, and you're a prisoner with no agency over any of the anything. The sailors tried to abandon the ship. But then the next verse says they actually lost the lifeboat, and they had to cut it off because it was bouncing around. So now they don't even have a lifeboat. Good job, guys. Uh, the next one, Tom. Just as the, as the day was dawning, Paul urged everyone to eat. And everyone was encouraged, and they began to eat. And after eating, the crew lightened the ship even further by throwing the cargo of wheat overboard. I mean, are you kidding me? Like, you, you, do you ever look at someone's life and you say, you are your worst enemy. You keep making stupid, stupid decisions. Somehow I never notice in my life when I lighten my load by throwing out the most important things like rest. Next one. Um, when morning dawned, they did not recognize the coastline, but they saw a bay with a beach and they wondered if they could get to shore by running the ship aground. But they hit a shoal and ran the ship aground too soon. The bow of the ship st uh, stuck fast while the stern was repeatedly smashed by the force of the waves and it began to break apart. Awesome. It's just getting worse. Next one. So the soldiers wanted to kill all the prisoners to make sure they didn't swim ashore and escape. <laughs> this is just it's getting better and better. Next one. <laughs> The commanding officer wanted to spare Paul, so he ordered all who could swim to just jump overboard and make it for land. Great. How many of you could swim through a gale force windstorm to get to shore while your boat was break? Good luck. Good luck. But chapter 28, they actually do, they make it ashore, but it's super cold, super rainy, and they need to build a fire. So, Tom, as Paul gathered an armful of sticks, he was lying them on the fire. A poisonous snake bit him on the hand. <laughs> This is literally out of the frying pan and into the fire, a fire made of snakes. Too much, too much. So folks, this is Paul's third shipwreck of his life. If you sail enough, you're gonna do that. But this one's a doozy. And you have to, like, how much more can he take? How much more can we take? How does he hold it together? And you, you know the question, you, you know when the teeth are so clenched and you just, like, I just, my hands are up, I give up or my hands are clenched and I punch back. And you, you know there's these little strategies that like, they could help, like slow down. You know that if you slow down, uh, that, that does something, especially when you have enough strength to slow down, then you can slow down and do something. Great, not when you're in crisis. Or take a break from everything and just focus on the one thing that matters. That's super helpful when you're out of crisis. Eat some food to revive yourself. That's always going to do something. And something might be a more upset stomach, so now you're in trauma and you're in crisis. 
But even when you get to somewhat stable ground, cold and not able to even have a fire, if you're stable ground objectively, and everyone tells you objectively, you're in a great spot right now, what do you do when it just still feels like it's one thing after another? What do you do when it just won't stop? Paul was damaged. He was delivered, but he was damaged. Now he's delivered, and he keeps getting more damaged. And this deliverance is nothing like he expected or nothing like he prayed for. Act 3. Hey, guys, how you doing? We're here. <laughs> That's good. So, we don't need to operate immediately, but we will want to get you on the schedule within the next few weeks. Okay, um, thank you so much. See you soon. <laughs> what, what did they say? They found a tumor on her brain. A what? Um, a mass, like a, like a, a lump of cells on my brain. I, I just have to have surgery to get it removed. Well, that sounds so scary. Are you going to be okay? It is scary, but the doctors say it should be easy to reach. Is it cancer like Grandma had? Um, they don't think so. Hopefully it's just benign. How do they know? Something about the scan that they did, but once they take it out, they'll do more tests to, just to make sure. Mom, why are you smiling? Oh, um, I guess because we have an answer. But it's scary. Sure it is, but that's okay. Knowing is better than not knowing, you know? Yes, it's scary. Surgery on my brain. <laughs> and eight weeks of recovery, I might have more seizures, other side effects, that's all scary. But I know now, and it's real. And best of all, there's a path forward. It was three months after the shipwreck that we set sail on another ship. And when he arrived in Rome, Paul was permitted to have his own private lodging guarded by a soldier. Three days after his arrival, Paul called together the local Jewish leaders. So he's on house arrest, right? This is a white collar criminal. He's on house arrest. And he gets a chance to explain his case to the law people, and he gets a chance to be with the other Jewish leaders there. And he tells them about the he tells them the Messiah has come, and he talks to him a little bit, and and uh, they get to talking about Jesus. Some were persuaded by the things he said, but others did not believe. Okay, so good news is Paul does gain his freedom. Bad news. His whole Christian career, he's been bankrolled by Jerusalem. That's how it, it kind of works. If you see the end of so many of his letters, he says at the end, don't forget the saints, which means send some money to Jerusalem so I can keep doing my job, which is fair. But now he has to pay his own way. And his whole career, he's gone to places and he's planted churches. And even, even when there's been a lot of resistance, they have grown. They have been successful. He has seen evidence that God is shining some joy right there. Here, some did not believe. It was hard. It wasn't working. It wasn't growing while he was there. So this is not the hallelujah ending that he wanted. This is not the hallelujah ending that he expected. And you might consider for him, I, I, like Paul was, if, if you've lived your whole life and nothing ever works out, it's just like something else doesn't work out. Paul was a guy at the top of his class in college. He went to the best law school. He had an internship, like right off the bat. This, this is what it would look like in America today. He had the future in the palm of his hand. He completely changed careers and was completely successful in that. He was so respected. His influence grew. His legacy would be incredible. If anything, he's the one person in the whole world that should be invited to Rome, invited, not shipped there on a prison ship. He should be invited to Rome to have a meeting with Caesar and he could have he could change the whole world but instead he limps toward the end of his life so successful and now so broken all that stuff of the past it it, it still mattered like he did that it mattered 
but it seemed so distant. So who was he now at this stage of his life? Who was he? What does he, what, what does he have that still matters? Well, what he has is the capacity to surrender. Paul has lived such a big and adventurous life. And as he settles into his later years, he starts to realize and have wisdom and fulfillment in a small life. He's come through alive and he's come through strong enough, or at least the spirit has been strong enough for him. But he was damaged. That's a fact. We're all damaged and we're all delivered one way or another. And now he's delivered, not with the happy ending that fairy tales always hold. He's delivered, the way we read the story together, is that he has found a textured sense of liberation and redemption and, in a sense, healing that he never could have prepared for. Act four. Thank you so much for bringing over dinner. We had some stuff in the freezer, but it's been a hectic week and I just, you know. Um, honey, will you pray? Uh, yeah. Heavenly Father, thank you for this food and the hands that prepared it. Thank you that. Thank you that mom is home. Yes. Thank you for bringing her home to us. Is that right? I don't know if I'm thankful. It's all been so hard for her, for all of us, and there's so much ahead that's still so hard. I don't think I'm thankful for hard things. I'm glad I'm home. I'm glad the surgeons knew what to do. God, I'm thankful for knowledge and experts and kind hands. Please help mom feel all better. Give people the right words to say and give people silence when they need to just listen. God, I don't think we're strong enough for this. Help us be strong. Be enough for us. We've made it this far. We're damaged but delivered. Damaged and delivered. Um, Amen. Yeah.